There are multiple ways to keep in touch with the Wolf Connection podcast through our Instagram handle, the Wolf Connection Pod. And for comments and questions, send us an email to podcast at wolfconnection.org with your comments, questions, and guest ideas for Stephen and myself. You may hear your question answered on an upcoming podcast. Thank you for your support and howls to you all. Welcome to the Wolf Connection Podcast. I'm your host, John Calvin. Let's talk about some more. Joining us today from Seashelt, British Columbia, she is the Director of Community and Systems, the Wolf Campaigner for Pacific Wild, Lori McConnell. It is a pleasure to have you on here. Thank you so much for responding and being available as quickly as you as you did. How's everything going today? Great. And this is a good test for me because we're thinking of doing a podcast with Pacific uh, Wild. So No, this is great. This is this is the one, trust me, we're still learning and we're two years in almost. So <laughs> Pacific Wild, that's a great podcast name. One hundred percent. So just Lori, you we've been reading up. By the way, the website is absolutely phenomenal. Mm-hmm. We've I, I was going through it for a couple of days. And if you guys get a chance, it is pacificwild.org. We will be hitting that a couple of times throughout the, the episode so you guys know where to go. But just give everyone a basic understanding of what Pacific Wild is and what their mission does for the wildlife and the ecosystem up there in British Columbia. Okay, so Pacific Wild was started by Ian and Karen McAllister almost 20 years ago. And... It originally started in the Great Bear Rainforest where they lived at the time. They lived there until maybe four or five years ago when their uh, children uh, were of high school age. So, uh, and they still have a home on Denny Island uh, just outside Bella Bella. So it was the first and I think the only nonprofit organization located within the Great Bear Rainforest and focusing on the Great Bear Rainforest. And they started with a goal to protect the Great Bear Rainforest and were a part of um, a number of organizations and individuals involved in the creation of the Great Bear Rainforest Agreement. Um, So from there, we were asked to become involved in the uh, Sailor Sea Herring fishery uh, call for a moratorium and we began that project about five years ago we were involved in the ban on the grizzly hunt in British Columbia province-wide that took about 10 years to achieve Um, the ban on fish farm expansion we have been involved in the not only the MPA for the Scott Islands uh, Mm. but the MPA network itself which is uh, Uh, sort of a grand uh, container for all of the small, unique MPAs in the area from the north end of Vancouver Island up to Haida Gwaii. Um, And that has been a 10-year project. Uh, We were part of the Ban Tankers campaign uh, around Enbridge. And since uh, also the Central Island Salmon campaign, which is uh, mostly related to there is very little enumeration of salmon stocks in the streams of the central coast, and yet fishing quotas are being allocated. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the past few years, we've seen uh, Indigenous guardians and stewardship, um, you know, the stewards programs get very involved and sort of take ownership of, as they should, for their territories for making sure um, that they understand what's in that environment and what kind of protections it needs. And since 2015, we have been involved in the Save BC Wolves campaign, which originally started only around uh, calling for an end to the aerial wolf killing program that BC has implemented in its quest to uh, save endangered caribou. And because... uh, Ian McAllister and Karen have spent so much time on the coast. They've spent a lot of time with the coastal sea wolf, which is a very different wolf from the interior wolf and has different challenges facing it. So that's pretty much um, who we are. I think we're a little bit different because um, our visual assets from not only Ian McAllister, but other photographers Uh, really sets us apart. And we have a very good um, creative department. 
led by Jeff Campbell, who is responsible for the website and all of our, he does everything from, you know, t-shirt designs and beer can designs for third-party fundraisers to our entire marketing and uh, communications pieces like our annual journal. So we're just so lucky to have Jeff. And I think that part of what we do is raise we raise the research and work of others up into the public sphere in a way that they can consume it and engage with it. What was happening in the great bear rainforest that inspired Ian and Karen to be involved in? And what did the, uh, what I assume would be categorized as exploitation look like? And what, what was at risk? And, and what was the social climate around the subject that inspired their action? So, of course, uh, First Nations have been, um, there's several, I think there's, there's three or four main First Nation communities, but all together around 20 to 22 communities in the Great Bear. And they have been uh, stewarding th- that territory for over 10,000 years and managing all the cycles and living sustainably. And I think mm. um, when and when it was discussed that Enbridge was going to come through with a major pipeline and tankers, that was in addition to horrendous logging practices um it was clear that the pressures facing the southern coast were coming for the central and north coast and it is one of the last temperate yeah. rainforests in the world uh and it it butts right up to the tongass natu- national forest in alaska and it takes visionary people to see early on what the potential is, both negative and positive, for a region as big as the Great Bear Rainforest. And of course, that that work has intensified with climate change and uh, a lot of the factors humans and other species are facing around the world. And we've made commitments as a country Uh, at the international level for protecting lands and waters and meeting climate change goals. And Ian and Karen understood very early on that a big territory like the Great Bear Rainforest with its, its own stewards and guardians already present is one of the best commitments. Protecting that is one of the best commitments that Uh, Canada can make. And I think people sometimes refer to um, places as being wild or wilderness, but First Nations tell us that's actually, you know, not correct because they have lived in harmony with the land, stewarding it, which means caring for it and basically gardening it and uh, managing all the species uh, for so long. So it's, it's, we have to separate from this idea of, you know, colonial stories of wilderness and wild places. It is full of nature, but, um, and they understood early on where the power was going to come from. For example, we were the only NGO to be in the area when the um, filming, when the Heltzik in Bella Bella declared their territory off limits for herring fisheries and did their first spawn on kelp fishery, which is a traditional practice that leaves the herring to spawn another seven to eight times instead of killing them for the row. How much of the rainforest is currently protected? I'd have to, I, I'm not really up on the mm-hmm. exact uh, uh, amounts of it. The important thing is that 2021 was the five-year review period for the agreement. And of course, everything was delayed because of COVID. And they're hoping to come out with a report this year. But um, Ian has been pretty clear that there has been logging happening that does not meet the terms of the agreement. So, you know, unfortunately, we always hope, and it's, it's not impossible, and it's not that there's no corporations doing the right thing. But by and large, corporations promise a lot and seem to always run out and deliver a little and have mea culpas 
all over the place. So unfortunately, it requires a lot of, of oversight and activism to keep these companies to their word. And in fact, now things are changing so fast because of climate change, temperature change. You know, fish species are traveling north to escape the heat at the equator. Fires are changing. Um, the forest patterns, which increases heat. There's just so many pressures that we used to be able to think in terms of 5, 10, 20 years. Now we don't know what's going to happen in two years. We had massive fires and floods last year and a horrendous heat dome that lasted for four or five days and killed, I think it was 400 people. I do remember that last year with, with the heat dome and, and it was extremely unorthodox for that to be happening up there. So piggybacking on Stevens, what's, so for you, how do you, how did you get involved with this? How was, what drew you to, to this organization? What drew you to, was it a specific species or was it just the overall messaging that Pacific Wild was doing and trying to keep the Great Bear Rainforest, you know, alive and, and kicking? Uh, I'm a big big fan of the ocean environment. So the whole concept of a co conservation organization working in the ocean, but not limited to ocean things was very attractive. And the visuals and creative approach of Pacific Wild was a huge draw because most organizations lacking someone like we have in Jeff, um, they it, it becomes more dissemination of data and research, and uh, it takes, people come to information in very different ways. Some people come to it through art, some through writing, some through visuals, and you have to be able to talk to them wherever they're at. And I just found Pacific Wild um, has a, a pop, I don't want to say popularity because it's not about a popularity contest and there's no contest anyways we're all working towards the same goals um, but there is an appeal to the way we do things that attracts people in a way that I'm also attracted so when when I'm talking with donors or collaborators on campaigns we start from a similar place and I just find the combination of the photography and the design and the creativity, um, also the creativity of the staff, uh, makes for a di very different organization. You know, we're, we're very much encouraged to direct ourselves in the areas that um, have strong appeal. You know, there's accountability and goals and all of those things, but there's a lot of room in the organization to learn new things, to find a specialization area. Um, you know, in the last few years, we've had a really good cohesive team. We have, we, um, uh, I think we recently lost someone to the Dis Department of Fisheries and Oceans, but she was actually recruited for the species at risk salmon group. So we're really happy that someone who understands advocacy from a nonprofit perspective is now working within the system because we know she understands from a different perspective. And, and I think that's what we're all going to need if we're um, going to materially change in the next few years as it's becoming more and more clear we're going to have to. Yeah, I think this is this is something that we, I can speak to Wolf Connection a little bit too. And, and what you're saying is that allowing people to grow into themselves, into their departments, into their roles, into an organization certainly helps moving forward. If you have, like you said, the right bodies and the right seats that are able to really focus on one thing and, and grow it from the inside out. And I think that's a great message that you just sent to have one of your own now working on the governmental side to really be in there and and helping a lot of this stuff move forward. So what's, when we, I don't know if, I know it's a rainforest, but give everybody just a little bit of an overview of the topography, the environment up there in the Great Bear. I know it's a rainforest, but what makes it so unique? Because 
I, I'm going to be honest, I didn't realize there was a rainforest on this side uh, in North America on the West Coast. So just give, give everybody an overview about what, if you were to look at it, you know, from a space view, I guess, what you're really looking at as you go into, into this place. And to add to that, if you can, you know, here we have, uh, I don't know if the land designations in Canada are, are the same, but, you know, we have national forests, national parks, BLM, public land, state parks, et cetera. What is the land designation of the, this rainforest that you're about to describe as well? So it is not a national park. Um, it's a regional area. And uh, I think the MPA would probably have the most effect on it. Um, it's, it's, uh, if, if anyone's ever been to northern Vancouver Island, y- you know that there are mountains and uh, steeply forested slopes and inlets, and it's like that, but magnified in the Great Bear Rainforest. Many of the islands out towards the coast are low-lying, and there, there can be, I was surprised when I visited that there were bogs on um, Denny Island You know, that was not what I expected in that topography, needing walking trails to get with upper boardwalks to get through there. Uh, But there are deep fjords, high mountains, and some of the world's best uh, salmon-bearing estuaries. These are gorgeous um, outflows from uh, high peak um, uh, precipitation and snow, uh, they're home to both uh, grizzly bears, black bears, and the spirit bears, which are uh, have a genetic, they're actually a, the um, offspring of black bears, but have a genetic difference that makes their uh, fur white. And there's a limited number of them, and they only exist in the Great Bear Rainforest. Yeah, they're referred to as spirit bears. And the sea wolves, um, you know, like... These places have the kind of biological diversity in the Great Bear that the southern coast had two or 300 years ago before um, uh, colonization and industrial fishing practices and logging practices. Um, they're, they're like an iconic landscape. And they they feel different when when you're there. They're very elemental and full of mystery, and they're also full of the spirit of indigenous peoples of the region, because it's you know we forget how young our country is and how little we actually know. We've only been here for a couple of hundred years, and you know for a people that's been there ten thousand years. I know the first time I went to Europe and walked out of a metro station in Paris into buildings from like the fifteenth century, it just blew my mind just how how little we know of of where we're from, and. So that big continuous rainforest down from the Tongass down to North Vancouver Island is, uh, it has some of the best fishing grounds in the world. Um, if it's managed sustainably, uh, it has beautiful forests that are old growth and, and actually, you know, if you've been through a second or third growth monoculture forest, it's not difficult to see how different they are from a true old growth forest with moss and you know it's it's not like you're breaking your legs walking through slash that's been grown over and it's it's full of light and a mix of tree species and and all of that is symbiotic with each other and when you go to a place like the great bear rainforest it's it's like you're your soul goes, oh, this is what it's supposed to be like. You know, we we don't even know what we've forgotten. Yeah. What is the what is the dream like in in your mind? And I mean, whether it's it's realistic or not, what's what's the ideal? Is it is it that the entire rainforest would be a protected area, a national park, open to the public, not open to the public, not open to logging industries, or is it just that the industries utilizing the resources there would would be kept in check somehow? Or and and I don't mean necessarily what's the realistic goal of Pacific Wild, but in, in your mind, like what's the what's the ideal scenario for this region? 
So I, I do think extraction of resources is possible because First Nations have been engaged in that for thousands of years. But their sustainability practices do not match um, what is driven by stakeholder returns and, you know, uh, a lot of the logging that's happened in British Columbia in the last five or six years is, is you know, going to a lot of these logging companies open mills down in the U.S. And so, you know, it's cheaper to process, they get more money for it. So the raw logs leave and the jobs go with it. And I watched a guy logging uh, in my community forest last year. And one guy with a machine can take out an acre of trees in an afternoon. Like it's not about jobs. And, you know, and this idea in, in Canada, corporations have argued for the right to be treated as a person in the court. So if you materially harm a corporation, they can sue you. And it's like, it's all out of balance. So, you know, and, and it's not for Pacific Wild to say, um, First Nations cannot derive economic value out of the lands, they, lands and seas they steward, because, you know, it's very hypocritical to sort of have a hundred years, two hundred years of pulling everything we can out of there, and then say, "Oh, look what we've done! Now nobody can have anything." A hundred percent. I on the logging issue because I think this is where we get into when we're talking about wolves. Is that, and I'm reading a, as part of the campaign and everything that you guys run for say BC Wolves. This really started with trying to reintroduce caribou, which were either not going extinct, but they the, the populations weren't holding their the numbers that everyone had liked. And to that degree, it seems that logging was a major problem and that they were losing their habitat and things of that sort. And then just like here in the United States in the West, a lot of the ungulate populations going down, they attribute to wolf predation. So just give everybody a little bit of a background too about how really this sort of came full circle that people were, you know, having an issue, why the caribou population is so dependent or the people are dependent on the caribou up there and why it was such a, a, a big deal to reintroduce or and to keep the populations up and then why it then turned to going after wolves. So the caribou is on our 25 cent piece in Canada. It is an iconic animal for Canada. It exists in many provinces. It's in the north. Um, yeah, and, and for First Nations, it is an integral part of not only their diet, but their entire culture. So, um, and, you know, they are a flag species for... Uh, demonstrating that the environment is suffering and is no longer no longer capable of sustaining the biodiversity the animals need and this all the the flora and fauna but that humans need for us to survive so when the caribou go that's a pretty big indicator that you know both from a uh, literal and figurative sense that we're not committed to biodiversity and we're not paying attention. And it's so some herds have extirpated, so they've disappeared. They had to take some animals from, you know, a small group that were not going to last and merge them with another herd in this in the southeastern part of BC. Um, and a lot of that is um, logging and it's because it's low valley, high productive forest that draw that provides the highest income. So there's a competition for what caribou require to survive. So they all, they need their critical habitat and they also need matrix habitat around them. And a good way to explain this is that um, the wolves in Yellowstone, a, a lot of them have been hunted this past year because they left the borders of the park and there's no buffer. And the, the hunters are just waiting on the edge. And, um, you know, there's, you'd have to have proof of it, but, you know, many people suspect the wolves are enticed over and 
uh, because a lot of people are philosophically opposed to uh, wolves on the landscapes, especially hunters. Um, so you can't talk about the aerial cull without talking about caribou. So what happened was in 2003, the federal government declared um, caribou a species at risk. And when when they are um, when they receive that designation, certain things have to happen at the provincial level. It triggers a whole series of actions. And um, every province has been slow to respond. Uh, there are uh, they have so from the provincial government's perspective, they have to show an end to the drop in population and then growth in population to show that they're going to be able to be sustainable on the landscape. Um, and I heard one government official say a couple of years ago, you know, we have to cull wolves because we have to be seen to be doing something. If we're not, they'll impose a unilateral solution on us, which we all know is habitat protection and an end to industrial activities in caribou habitat. So the government does not want the federal government telling them how to manage resources in the province. So, you know, I understand this is uh, we're a uh, province based in resource extraction in the past. Um, we have been moving a lot into tourism and, um, you know, new technology, health, all of those kinds of things. But especially in the rural areas, resource extraction is completely intertwined with a way of living and, and history. So, as we're all struggling with all the things we have to change, we can't fly so much. We have to have, you know, vehicles that are better on fuel consumption. We, we need to go to electric vehicles. We need to stop eating so much meat. I mean, all of these things humanity is facing, and it's no different in British Columbia. From our perspective, the old growth is going to run out. It's finite, and it is not going to return in our lifetimes or our children's lifetimes. It's probably four to five generations in normal times, and we are not in normal times. Fires, flooding, all of those things uh, mean we can't assume a return to old growth status in the same time frames that we did before, and we may never be able to return to that. So, so if the other part of it is not just logging in the central and northeast, it's um, oil and gas, seismic lines, fracking wells, um, road building, mines, and it's also recreational backcountry use, helicat skiing, snowmobiling. All of this fragments caribou habitat and provides high speed highways for wolves and other predators to get to where the caribou are. You you may have touched on it there a bit, but it sounds like, I mean, it sounds like what what what's happening is sort of classic in that we're trying to treat the symptoms, not really the cause, in terms of caribou caribou con conservation by bringing you know caribou from other herds or, or killing wolves, um, et cetera. But what what were they blaming the decline of caribou on largely? Well, they all say it's habitat loss and fragmentation. Okay. Everyone is in agreement that that there is insufficient habitat. So the the way the wolf cull is uh, put forward is it does the caribou recovery program and the government say it does create an increase in herd size and allows herds to stabilize. But everywhere that they have predator, everywhere that they have supplemental feeding or maternal pens, where they take the pregnant females and put them in there and they calve and they're there until they're able to get out and run at a decent speed. Um, they have said it's wolf culls that are doing it, even though they have those three factors. So if you take away supplemental feeding and net pans, what happens? If you take away um, net pans and only do supplemental feeding, what happens? 
Um, if you do supplemental feeding, maternity pans, and you use non-lethal predator management, what happens? Because you know we shouldn't be asking one species to pay with their lives to save another unless we have exhausted everything. Right, right. Is there a number on on the um, the mortality rate of caribou? I mean, how many how many caribou a year are wolves killing? There's no way to know that. So we don't know how many wolves there are in British Columbia. The provincial estimate is 8,500, but the plus minus on accuracy wow. could be wow. as high as is between 30 and 37 wow. percent. That's a lot. So it could be okay. 5,400 or 1,200. So we don't know how how what percentage of wolves we're killing. Certainly, when you kill most of a pack. Um, you you trigger a lot of breeding for one thing, and uh, you start to have issues with genetic diversity. And this this short term program, what they call short term, is they figure they're going to have to cull for decades until the forest is restored to old growth status. So you know, there's been uh, one scientist uh, who. Um, referred to it as a palliative measure because as soon as you stop killing wolves, the caribou decline. And while we're doing all this, further habitat is being removed. I mean, there was someone, a uh, scientist who posted a story maybe a month ago who said 60 uh, hectares came out of endangered caribou habitat when it was supposed to be um, deferred for five years. So there, and there's a lot of that happening. So, you know, and in the meantime, the government engages in all of these meetings around the province. So they they meet in these resource towns and they try and hammer out agreements, but the NDP government, and it would be no better under the liberals, which are very different from the provincial liberals. Um, they're a more conservative party in British Columbia, but, um, they are committed to the economy and the workers. That's who elects the NDP. And it's all about the economy. And, um, you know, I, I just saw the costs for the Napa Valley um, uh, winery losses due to smoke taint. And it was in the 30 or $40 billion. Like if, if, if we're going to talk about costs, it's way past time that we're we're not doing a full calculation of what it's costing us on insurance and loss of life and and um, degradation of habitat and um, dismantling of entire ecosystems, large tract ecosystems, which humans require in order for us to have life. And uh, but we don't seem to get there. So. And, and I don't mean to be dismissive about people's jobs. This is, uh, in rural communities, it's very different. Um, I don't think it's fair to say British Columbians living in populated areas in the South should have no say over what happens in the rest of the province. If, I mean, I personally don't even like the North American model of wildlife management because it, it, was itself developed as a response to overhunting. And it has at its core, the view of um, nature and uh, our ecological assets as only being present for human consumption. And if there's balance found, it's to re for humans to retain the ability to hunt and and you know get everything we want out of it as if there isn't an inherent value for nature itself to have existence undefined by humans and 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 you hear it in the language of well wolf populations are very resilient they bounce back quickly but that's a wolf family and you know we're using the wolf's nature by by netting it and putting a Judas collar around it and then around its neck and following it to the pack to kill it. You know that that is that is not relationship with species. You know indigenous people speak about they will harvest wolves, um, but it is wolves are seen as 
family relations in most First Nations culture, especially not so much in the North, but uh, in the Arctic, but in the rest of British Columbia. And everything is a relative, a tree, a creek. And so when you undertake to end that life or change its existence, it's from a very different perspective than I want what I want out of it. Yeah, there are a lot of parallels here to what here in the American West is going on and what they've dealt with for Mm-hmm. probably close to 100 years in terms of trying to right the wrongs of the past and the exterminations or the the almost exterminations of what happened to a lot of the predators on the landscape here. We're talking about the bears and the lions and the coyotes and the wolves that, that get the most uh, sex appeal, if you want to say that, because wolves resonate with more people probably than most. When you when you guys are going through this as an organization, what is the information? And I do want to get into the difference too, but but we're on this this wonderful topic right now. Well, not wonderful, but just this topic that needs to be you know fleshed out. So as you all at Pacific Wild, what's the what are the tools that you use to really get out the correct information? Because you did talk about you guys post a lot of great articles, a lot of research on the website, so that people in your community and around the province are able to look at the actual numbers, the actual effect to the species in and of itself. And what you said before, and that's that's my question, uh, is how you're getting it out. But also I love your point of we need to talk to these people in the rural communities because they are the ones that are surviving because of how they know how to do things or they, they've been doing these things for so long. And it's the same with the ranching community down here in the American West, is that these are people that are actually keeping these lands alive to a degree that if they were to not be there, the habitat loss would be just overwhelming because it would just be coming and developed. So I just, that, that point was something I wanted to note there. But yeah, how are you guys at Pacific Wild trying to get that information out there, the correct information and accurate information out there? Well, um, our creative team is very good with information graphics that can convey complex information in a simple visual way, which really helps people. Um, Obviously, we're visual storytellers and we show, um, we don't have a lot of depth in um, uh, interior wolf imagery because most of us do live on the coast. Um, but we are working with some other um, photographers. Uh, a lot of the, the photographers and people working on the inland uh, areas are really, you know, we're focused on the wolf cull, but they're focused on the caribou and on habitat protection because that's something everybody can agree on. And something that happens with wolves is deep polarization and it gets very hard to have the conversation. You, all, you get the, oh, you're a city slicker who's never been in the bush for five minutes. And, oh, you're a redneck who's never, you know, read research papers. It's all anecdotal. And, and to some extent, our government loves when we do that because then we're not talking about the habitat loss. So, you know, um, so that's one of the, the risks from that. Um, I think also changing the narrative around wolves and showing them as families and, uh, you know, like wolves are not the only animals that kill other animals to eat. This is, you know, and we're, we kill more animals than anybody. So, um, you know, kind of vilifying wolves is, uh, I think an old, an old trick um, that came with colonization to justify a whole bunch of things. And um, you'd think we would be getting past that, but, you know, I look at what's happening in resource communities and say in ranch communities in the American West and say a lot of this is a failure of imagination and a lack of collaboration. You, you know, the money exists in the world. The, the deep thinkers with the fantastic ideas that can change things exist in the world. But, but we keep um, 
uh, there was a, I don't know if you ever read the Narnia Chronicles, but there were the, uh, the trolls and the trolls were for the trolls and everyone else is sitting at a banquet and all the trolls can see is that they're in a table, it, 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 stuck in a stable with horse turds and that's all they get because that's all they can see. And, and that's a lack of imagination and commitment to a livable future. Like, I think we all understand we're going to have to change. And for people who love wildlife and love the back country and want to see these animals, you know, we're going to have to tame our appetites as well. I was looking at a photo from, I think it was Pakistan, and there was a tiger laying in a road and two trucks on each side loaded with people with cameras, I don't know, 50 yards away. And, and that's happening all day, every day in those areas, because now it's tourism and people taking pictures and it's still too much of a thing. And that's not the way that tiger's meant to live. You know, so when I talk to my conservation minded friends and say, you know, we're going to have to stop putting trails into the some of the backcountry and, and protected areas. Oh, well, no, no, we're we're low impact. You know, that's not the same as the loggers and the, the snowmobilers, but it is, you know, it's a crowded planet. There's way too many of us. We're all globally hopscotching everywhere and wanting to see everything and we're commodifying everything including the lives of other creatures and we need big intact relatively undisturbed ecosystems and these are what's going to provide the oxygen and you know reducing carbon and um, reducing these zoonotic diseases that are jumping to people. I mean, we're in the third year and now there's new variants of COVID and we're, we're still just as exposed to other pandemics. And because we keep, I don't know how we think, I need a house to live in to be safe, but we don't think uh, if, if we put in a neighborhood of 200 homes here, we're going to push the animals out and something's going to happen. You know, like we just don't think about those things. We're not holistic as a species. And, you know, we don't know what's in the heads of animals and other creatures either. But, you know, we do have brains enough to know better. Right. There's so much we don't know, but there's so much that we do know that we're not acting on. But I do find that point you made um, to be strange and conflicting is seeing people I see it on social media specifically a lot, especially hunters and, and ranchers vilifying wolves for being hunters and for how they hunt. I do find that disappointing and strange from folks who are close to the landscape and uh, assumably in, in touch with how the wild world works and, and how it expresses and, and all of its naturalness. But um, bouncing off of John's question, speaking of the, the methods and innovation of Pacific Wilds, so on the site I read... The Pacific Wild is on the front line of pioneering innovative technology for remote wildlife monitoring. Can you tell us about those technologies and maybe what the results of those innovations look like in the context of wolves? Uh, so we have, uh, when, when Ian McAllister was shooting and directing the Great Bear Rainforest IMAX film, which is coming out around uh, the world now that people are back in theaters, uh, a lot of that footage was shot by drone. And uh, the IMAX cameras and film has it, it, the, the whole way of shooting has changed. That would not have been possible 10 years ago. The cameras just weighed a ton and you're having to string them up between trees. And like it, the, uh, I remember seeing the red camera for um, the IMAX filming because I was out on the boat uh, for a couple of days, the habitat where Ian's film boat when he was shooting for the IMAX and seeing this small $150,000 camera hanging from a gimbal on a wearable harness. And, and you know, and he came back and um, we got to see the, the footage on the computer on the boat and instantly of this wolf pack. And uh, it was the pan-optical 
style, which I'd never seen before in raw footage. And that was the day he tried a fisheye lens on his camera and the wolves were biting it because they could see their reflection. And when we saw it in the theater, I saw that uh, image at the end of the film and the hairs just went back up on the back of my neck. Felt very privileged to be a part of that. There was a lot of drones used and we're not talking the little commercial drones that we use. These are things that needed to be on the, the front. So the habitat is a catamaran and, uh, and it has this big deck net area and the drone takes up the entire case of it. And Ian didn't run those drones. You had to have licensed drone operators and insurance because they were taking these really expensive cameras up into the air with limited time. And yeah, and some of the shots that they got from that were amazing. Uh, right before I joined Pacific Wild in 2017, I think it was probably 2014, 2015, they had um, Great Bear Live, which was a series of live streaming cameras in the Great Bear, a, Great Bear, a hugely popular program. People signed up for it, donated for it. Um, it was amazing, but very, very challenging to maintain. At that time, Karen and Ian lived in the Great Bear. Staff lived in the Great Bear. Some of them still live there and work for the health sec, for example. Um, but the maintenance for these things and the streaming in an area, that was before TELUS came there with the big towers. And literally, they had to have like camera bells over the underwater cameras and someone had to dive to check the housings and to get the, the cards out of it. And then they had to boat over to land and take a vehicle up and then hike up to the top where they put a receiver to be able to send the data. And that's just super unsustainable you know, and it's still not there yet. It's, I so wish we could have it back. You know, it's frustrating that somebody on Hornby Island can have a camera off the corner of their house into an eagle's nest, but we can't get stuff out of the Great Bear. But, you know, it's staff, it's, it's the equipment costs. Um, a lot of it is just, you know, how do you have someone who knows how to handle that tech kind of technology and massive amounts of content generated that need to be stored and delivered in a place where, you know, there's a, a little um, community in Bella Bella with a little store. And if you go to Bella Coola, you know, you can get out to Williams Lake or something, but it's, it, it's, um, that that's not typically a place where you have people talented in multimedia and and really obscure underwater and above ground skills to do that. So I've kind of had to let that one go. I harped on it quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hear you. It's it's a it's a huge undertaking to do anything uh, to that scope, especially when you're talking about a rainforest. I, I want to get to just describe to everyone the difference with these and what's you really unique and special about these wolves because they they are different they're the bcc wolves what what can people or what can you tell everyone out there who a, a lot of our the majority of our podcasting has been and i think people's referencing of wolves is typically to the gray and the timber wolves out in the western united states the ones in wisconsin michigan things of that sort the only other ones I think we spoke about were the Iberian wolves in Spain, which I was, we were happy to learn about them. But just describe, because I, I do tours sometimes at, at Wolf Connection, and I always mention the sea wolves just because I've seen just how unique they look. But just tell everyone, what are these main differences? Why do they, how are they able to exist in this, in this area, uh, specifically along a coastline, and, and how adaptable they really are? Their diet and things of that sort. So um, sea wolves, which a lot of people are working on the process of getting them designated as an evolutionary significant unit. And that way you can get special protections for them separate from what exists for gray wolves. That's a, a long uh, project. 
but they are uh, slimmer and rangier than the um, interior wolves. Uh, I don't think they have the same body mass and bone structure. Um, they, 85% of their diet comes from the marine environment. So if there's somewhere they can hunt deer, they'll hunt deer. Uh, a lot of them, especially on outlying islands and right near the edge of the water, if they're right along the coast with their packs, uh, they, they hunt seals. Um, there's, um, they, a lot of, they don't hunt them in the water, but they, they are watching for, they will get them from the shore because Takea did that. He hunted seals right at the shore. Um, they'll eat mussels and clams and, you know, dig in the sand for things. Uh, there was a great shot in, uh, um, movie about a very sad instance where one of the estuaries that had been filmed in, for the beginning of the IMAX actually had a, a horrific um, landslide and it covered the estuary and the bears couldn't find the salmon and pull them out. But wolves have such a good sense of smell and are such good diggers that they could get salmon out of the mud, um, you know, from like a foot down. Uh, so, you know, they're they swim between islands, often long distances. Um, they are common all along the coast. Uh, they're on Vancouver Island, right down to the southern tip of Vancouver Island, which is heavily populated. Um, they are quite elusive and you don't see them very often. Uh, they, they have been seen more uh, of, around the populated areas of Tofino and Euclid because people like to run their small dogs on the beach without leashes and without oversight and the wolves have found them good hunting. So, you know, that's quite an issue. A couple of beaches, they've banned dogs now because they, they don't want to have those kinds of interactions between humans and wolves and pets because they know how that affects how wolves are viewed. Um, they uh, they tend to have smallish packs um, on Vancouver Island. They uh, Takea. I don't know if you know the story of Takea the sea wolf. So he was a coastal sea wolf who lived on the Discovery Islands, which is about a mile away from Victoria. Um, a mile south in between Victoria and uh, the Olympic Peninsula. And he could be seen by binoculars from Victoria. And he lived there for nine years alone. And he was a very plump and happy looking wolf. And he got all his food from the marine environment. He would swim between the chain of islands to do his hunting. And he lived on the, the main island. Um, and he has... So uh, in March of 2020, he ended up in Victoria. Uh, Cheryl Alexander wrote a book about him and did a film that has changed the perception of wolves for many people around the world and has really introduced the coastal sea wolf to an international audience. Um, so she filmed him for these eight or nine years and um, he became accustomed to her, but not ha habituated. And people would often kayak or boat to the Discovery Islands, bring their dogs. And he was very interested in dogs because he lived alone. Um, and they were the closest thing to wolves he ever saw. Uh, so this one very rough evening and night in uh, March of 2020 in a storm, he ended up in Victoria. And he was sighted all over Victoria. Cheryl has a map of his travels and, and videos of stories from people who saw him on his journey through the city. And we suspect as a nine-year-old wolf, that's very old for a wild wolf. And he may have gotten caught in a tidal surge that happens between two of the islands. And he may have been pushed to the shore in bad weather. And when conservation officers picked him up, 
they didn't return him to the islands. They took him to the west coast of Vancouver Island and uh, let him go in a territory that he didn't know where other wolves were in proximity. And the hunters all knew he was there. And he got halfway back to the Discovery Islands. He was making a loop all the way through Vancouver Island and uh, was around the Shawnigan Lake area when a hunter with two dogs, um, he said he was helping track a cougar for a friend, but um, we suspect they knew Takeo was interested in dogs and used the dogs to attract him and a hunter shot and killed him. And uh, it was it was just a horrific end to his life and people around the world who had heard this story and were waiting to see what happened with him were, were just heartbroken that that's how his life ended. And he became pretty much an ambassador for sea wolves around the world. And sea wolves are actually similar or the same to the archipelago, Alexander Archipelago wolves in Alaska. So it's, it's kind of that whole landmass. They don't recognize the borders. And um, people were so uh, struck by the death of Takea that from that has come an annual arts festival, a film, a couple of books. Um, we, so the other side, we work on our wolf call campaign, which just to close off, I'll just talk about the legal thing. So we took the government to court uh, around the illegality of the call, saying that the regional manager did not have the authority to just assign uh, the contracts to people to go and shoot them from helicopters. Uh, so, and it was a very complex case. It's way more complicated than that. But at any rate, we took them to court. It took a year to get a court case because of COVID. Uh, and then it was six months before we went to court. And we were happy to see the judge called for an extra day. And so the last day of the court case was in October of 2021. And we still haven't had a judgment on that. Meanwhile, two wolf calls have occurred while we've had this before the courts. Uh, and so last year they killed 237 and this year 280. It costs the province this year $1.8 million. It's about $6,000 now per wolf. Um, you know, but when you think of, you see how the government's math mind works compared to, you know, it, the economy. Um, and so we're waiting. We've been told our judgment will come out no later than June 6th, and we're prepared for both eventualities. You know, we win, we lose. So um, that's where we are on the legal challenges. Now, I see there's a question about the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, and this also ties into Cheryl's work around the sea wolves. Um, there was an episode, I think it was a year and a half ago, and uh, a woman who called herself the Ink hunt, Inked Huntress went down to Machosan in on the southern Vancouver Island. It's a little area of land that goes out. There's Victoria and it comes around. It's all very coastal. And it's this one little area with a bay and long area of land, a, a peninsula. And there's a pack there. And she shot, she trapped and then killed two wolves and put up pictures of herself on Instagram holding up dead wolves from Machosan. And talked about, you know, eradication of the entire pack is always the goal. Um, you know, these, had, I was asked to come in because they were predating on people's pets. And uh, that just blew up. She ended up taking her profile down. Um, you know, the pictures disappeared. But what er came out of that was Cheryl began the work for a call on a moratorium against the recreational or sport hunting of wolves until scientific and ethical concerns were addressed. 
On Vancouver Island, you can only kill three wolves, but you don't have to have a special license or a tag. In, in Vancouver, where you know wolves are pretty rare, the rest of the province, there's no bag limit, no oversight, no tags, no nothing. So, and we don't have an accurate population count either. So, um, yeah. And so Cheryl started the push for this moratorium, which the mayor of Souk, Maya Tate, took up and they um, submitted a, uh, I don't I think it's called a motion. I can't remember what it is, but it's it's something you submit at the Union of BC Municipalities level. And it was requesting all municipalities in British Columbia to step behind this call for a, a moratorium and a review of how wolves are hunted in BC. And they ran out of time to actually address it in their, you know, all these extra amendments come at the end and you don't always get to them all and it's sort of fallen off the wayside. But we now have a um, official um, global uh, wolf day um, declared in Souk of May 24th, which is the day that Takea died. There is a global howl for unity where people howl for Takea and send in the videos. And um, there's an uh, art festival in the fall. And, uh, you know, Cheryl's very well connected after years as a wildlife uh, photographer and documentary creator. Um, she knows a lot of people, both um, publicly and, and great people to get information from um, sort of off record. Uh, and, um, for example, there were hunters who were saying, um, in some of the bigger Gulf islands that wolves were taking all the ungulates. And a field technician from the provincial government said he did a research project where he, um, he went out and actually accounted for ungulates, deer, mule-tailed deer mostly, um, before, during, and after the legal hunt period for deer in BC. And he said he actually documented that as soon as hunting season began, the deer disappeared. They abandoned their feeding patterns. Um, they uh, All they did was spend their energy um, maintaining invisibility to human predators. And as soon as hunting season was over, they came back out. And I don't know why hunters think that, you know, animals that have evolved as prey species for millennia don't recognize humans as predators and adapt to them. So, but that was somebody within government, very informally, no name, but saying to a hunter, you're actually not correct. It wasn't wolves. It's the deer themselves. I mean, they're starving themselves to stay away from you. So that was a very interesting bit of information to get. And she knows trappers and, you know, that's the other thing in BC. There are so many trap lines close to populated areas, like just off trails, you know, back country that's easily accessible. And, uh, you know, right in like towns like Duncan, right on the edge of Duncan, BC on Vancouver Island, they're taking like 20 wolves a year out of there. You know, people have, people have no clue. I was reading that in, I'm not sure if it was Montana or Idaho, where people's pets are getting caught in traps. It's yeah. anywhere that trapping's legal, really. Yeah. Yeah. Trapping and all that stuff and the lines and people, people, pets. I mean, they have to, you know, other species also. They're they're trapping, you know, foxes. I and know. And, and what stuff, year yeah. is it? Are we in the eighteen hundreds? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's that that battle between keeping tradition or adapting to modern methods and, and that whole conversation. But yeah. not knowing how many of something there are. And they're a native species to North America, but there's indiscriminate hunting of them without, you know, a stat. I mean, the whole point of these agencies is to find out, is to use taxpayer dollars to find out the status of species so we can make informed decisions. Well, look what happened in Wisconsin last year. They set a, 
uh, uh, number they wanted removed, and hunters took a yeah. hundred more before they could stop them. Honestly, even if you're a hunter who doesn't like wolves, but you're a taxpayer, it should just be maddening. It's it's com- it's totally lazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know. Yeah, the money. Well, and the there, there was a poll done in British Columbia three or four years ago talking about social license for trophy hunting and 85 percent of british columbians said they were against sport trophy hunting and um you know it's debatable now they're talking about people are really pushing to have grizzlies returned for trophy hunting and they're talking about treating it as a meat hunt and a guide uh, who was involved in the and to trophy hunting of grizzlies said in 30 years of taking people out for grizzlies, no one ever took the meat. It's like inedible. Mm. So, Actually, I was going to ask you that because you were you were into uh, grizzly work at some point, right? What or, uh, or bear work? What is like? How do you designate trophy hunting versus hunting for food, and right. how do you maintain a clear distinction between the two when like enacting management and in in the context of legality? I guess. Well, obviously, people who are being paid to guide other people, that's that's one level of them. Um, there are people who hunt species like black bear for food. Um, but grizzlies typically have not been hunted for food uh, in many, many years. I think people who are starving might do it, but that is not modern man for sure. Um, and people will say that they did a massive poll of BC Wildlife Federation members, which the name is, is just so offensive to those of us in con- conservation because it's a hunting organization. So they did a massive poll with them and they said, you know, what are the main reasons you hunt? And people were all to be with family, to be out in the wild, appreciating nature. And it's like you can you can have an answer for all of those things if you're not hunting for meat. You can be with family without killing something. You know, you can you can choose not to kill if you're not going to consume. There there are so many choices people can make, and if they're not hunting for trophy, why are there Daniel Boone? competitions for best specimen biggest specimen like they're all competing if nobody would show up to those things if it wasn't trophy hunting when so when you're talking about these legal challenges and everything that's in the pipeline right now and the the resolution for the support of the bc first nations territorial management what's the future for both the 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 great bear uh national forest and Pacific Wild in terms of the actions moving forward in helping keep, keep I guess, the, the trophy hunting at bay to keep the wolf population safe, to help the, the MPAs, which are the marine protected areas. What are, what are the goals moving forward in 2022 and beyond for all of you? Because it seems like it's a, it's a huge mountain to climb. Uh, for the Great Bear Rainforests, we're paying a lot of attention to this review period and, um, you know, monitoring all of the satellite imagery that's coming in, showing the logging, um, <laughs> supporting, um, actually standing back to support First Nations in, you know, um, managing their traditional territories and claiming that space at the table as a leader. You know, nonprofits have done a great job for decades of pushing for accountability and protections and everything. But now First Nations are coming into their own with their own economic development arms, stewardship programs, um, teaching programs, uh, the passing along of knowledge one generation to the next, which is a lot it's a big change to go from oral culture to, you know, recorded culture. And, um, you know, they are demanding, uh, especially under the United Nations um, resolution that British Columbia adopted for those rights and fighting for them. So, you know, it's, I don't think it's a time for an NGO to be right in the forefront of things. We support where we can, we amplify where we can, we do storytelling, which helps elevate that. 
when it comes to the wolf campaign, uh, we just had a great collaborative campaign with the Animal Alliance of Canada, the Fur Bearers, and uh, the Huma Humane Society International in Canada, plus Cheryl Alexander and the Union of BC Indian Chiefs on a collaborative campaign on uh, educating people that it is habitat loss and fragmentation that is responsible for caribou decline and no amount of killing wolves is going to change that, especially while we're still losing it. So we had bus ads in Victoria and Langford where the uh, premier's riding is, um, bike rack ads, radio, billboards right off the ferry when you come to visit Vancouver Island and Victoria, our provincial capital. And, and that has been a really successful program. But the partnership with the Union of BC Indian Chiefs is very powerful. It came to us unsolicited. Uh, they just sent a letter in support of Pacific Wilds campaign directly to the government and CC'd us on it. And then uh, we invited them to get involved in this collaborative campaign. And Judy Wilson, a chief from the um, Okanagan area, uh, has been the lead on this. And, uh, you know, we were able to get content explaining First Nations views on wolf management um, and the predator killing that, uh, and calling for an end to the aerial program completely, uh, saying it's up to the nations to manage and steward their territories. And uh, all of this has arisen through poor provincial management of resources and, um, you know, failure to care for uh, at-risk species. And we have some really exciting things happening with them that will be over the summer. And we'll have uh, perhaps a short film, short doc in the fall uh, that is going to be very powerful and inv involving um, wolf families across the continent. So, you know, and that will help to change the story. I don't know if you saw um, uh, Rain Stanislaw, um, Rain um, Last Bear Standing, he, he uh, wrote a treaty for wolves in the United States and 200 Native American tribes have signed on to it. And he also created a film about wolves and that probably had some of the largest effect on the reversal of endangered, like the re return of endangered species protections to wolves in 48 states. So he's, he's interested in um, continuing that work. And, you know, we're, we're hoping to do a lot more collaborations and per perhaps, you know, it's time for NGOs and conservation-minded people to work across Canada to hold the federal government accountable for allowing so much time to elapse between when a species is designated endangered and when plans and actual protections come into place. Because this has been happening for almost 20 years in British Columbia, and they state they're still in negotiations. Like it's, it's just ludicrous. Business would never do this, you know? Yeah. No, 20 years is, yeah, that's, that's a stalemate of what they're doing. Uh, Lori, I just, I want, before we let you go, we got, uh, I have two more things. So just tell everybody, because we covered a lot here. So just tell everybody the website again for Pacific Wild, the, uh, spell out the name of, of the, the wolf that you, the sea wolf you guys were talking about. Uh, and what Cheryl Alexander's book is as well, so they can maybe do some more research and check out those things. Okay, well, our website is pacificwild.org. Uh, for, for people very interested in wolves, like your listeners, we have a online wolf community of support. It's free to join. It's a closed social network. It's called SaveBCWolves.org, and there is a section for wolves around the world, and we try to keep, you know, adding content about what's happening to the south of us, and, you know, we just posted about the group of pups born for the North Carolina red wolves, which is very exciting. Um, Rain's working on a project for the Mexican uh, um, uh, gray wolf, 
Uh, so, and people are adding content from around the world about wolves. We're, we're trying to turn, there's about 3,100 people in this network and we just completed a survey project. We would like this to become a self-organizing group to do art projects, advocacy actions, protests, you know, wh wh however people can organize with others like them and contribute time and talents to things. Um, so uh, that is um, a really great way for wolf enthusiasts to get involved. Uh, it's only as active as people make it. So if, if people get in there, they should start posting and commenting and getting in conversations with people. The wolf uh, we referred to earlier is Takaya, T-A-K-A-Y-A. And the book is called Takea, Lone Wolf of the Discovery Islands. And those of you that are, everyone that's listening here, I'm going to have all of these, we are going to have all of these links, everything posted in there so you guys don't miss anything uh, that, you know, Lori just said. And you guys can all check out pacificwild.org, obviously, and look for all that, that wonderful content. Lori, my last question or our last question that we ask everybody is when you hear the word wolf, what is the thing that comes to your mind? Family. Yeah, they are. An engineer. They're great engineers. I love that. Yeah, this, is, uh, this has been wildly eye-opening and extremely informative. So thank you, Lori, for just giving everybody out there all the information and, you know, giving us some more things to look up and more people to contact and to keep this conversation rolling. So thank you so much for all that you do. Uh, you're extremely passionate and the world is a better place with you in it. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the chance to talk about our work. And, you know, maybe you guys can join SaveBCWolves.org too and post <laughs> information about your podcasts. Yeah, yeah. We got to get up there too. No, so we got place we just got to get to. <laughs> yeah. We got trust me, we got a pin in the map now, Lori. So if we're <laughs> if we're heading up to BC, you're going to be one of our contacts. So be ready. Oh, and one one final thing, yeah. we're we're having our annual fundraiser called the Wild Auction. So this is largely it developed first out of art. So that's May 16th to 20th, and there'll be a link on our website, and there'll be lots of wolf related art and items in the auction if people want to bid on them. Nice. All right, yeah, everybody listen to that. And like I said, please go to pacificwild.org. That, that'll have all the information there. Lori McConnell, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, howls to all of you out there. And Steve and I will be with you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Looking to support Wolf Connection or sponsor one of the wolves in our pack? Just go to wolfconnection.org, click on the Donate tab, and find out more information. 